As vaccination continues across New England, many are left wondering, what can I do once I'm vaccinated? You vaccinate people and you push back on the pandemic so much, we're breaking the chains of transmission and the virus can't move from person to person if you vaccinate enough people. From the New England News Collaborative, this is Next. What we know about the COVID-19 vaccines, new variants, and the rollout. And ropeless fishing gear could help save endangered right whales from extinction. But before lobstermen can use it, there are still a lot of bugs to work out. We need to put five boats in a big square, fish and ropeless, mobile gear, and see what really happens. Plus, what it's like to work as a ski patroller in the middle of a pandemic. So guys, just a reminder, PPE all the time, right? Anytime you're with a guest, anytime you're having an interaction, base area, summit, on the hill. It's next. Next is produced at Connecticut Public Radio and is powered by the New England News Collaborative, 10 public media companies coming together to tell the story of a changing region with support from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. I'm Morgan Springer. Thanks for joining us. It should go without saying, some New England states are vaccinating against COVID-19 quicker than others. Here's the ranking from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention as of this taping. We've got Connecticut at the top, with about 11% of people getting a first dose. They're followed by Vermont, then Maine, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, and finally Rhode Island. Joining us to talk about the rollout are three New England News collaborative reporters who cover health. Martha Biebinger at WBUR in Boston, Patty White at Maine Public Radio, and Nicole Leonard at Connecticut Public Radio. And we'll start with you, Martha. Why has the vaccination rollout been slower in Massachusetts? Well, Morgan, our Governor Charlie Baker would say that it's because Massachusetts has taken a more sort of targeted approach, focusing on People in homeless shelters and prisons and group homes where there have been clusters of cases doing that instead of offering shots to, say, all of the state's oldest residents right away. But there have been a lot of glitches, too. So it's a pretty clunky online registration system. The state has sent too many doses to some sites and not enough to others. There have been some challenges persuading people in these vulnerable groups to get vaccinated. Now, Morgan, I'm also hearing, though, about some pushback on these state rankings that you referenced in the introduction. Dr. Tom Sequist oversees equity at the largest hospital network in Massachusetts. It's called Mass General Brigham. And Dr. Sequist says some of the states that are vaccinating people quickly and so doing really well in these rankings are doing so with large venues in the suburbs that are more likely to cater to white residents. This choice to support these venues that aren't accessible to communities hardest hit by the COVID pandemic is another form of structural racism that perpetuates gaps in health outcomes. So what does he suggest instead? Dr. Sequist would like to see state rankings based on, for example, how many Black, Latinos, or members of other minority groups have been vaccinated, or maybe how many people in in the state's hardest hit communities have received their shots. Because the weight of the evidence highlights that it's these populations that have the highest burden of COVID illness. And, And therefore, it's these populations that we should really be focused on increasing the vaccination rates among. That's really interesting because like Massachusetts, Rhode Island has also been slower, but the state has decided to do exactly what he's suggesting by focusing on vaccinating residents in an area that has especially high infection rates, that's Central Falls, Rhode Island. But then on the other end of the spectrum, there's Connecticut, which leads the pack in New England in terms of the share of the population that's gotten the first dose. And on the surface, that sounds good. But Nicole, what about equity? It does look good on paper. Connecticut is in the top tier of states that are vaccinating people very quickly, and the state chose to strictly keep its eligibility to residents 75 years and older. But then you have to look at who these residents are, and Connecticut's oldest population is majority of white residents. We know that from new data that wealthier and whiter suburban towns are vaccinating their residents faster, leaving behind some of the more rural towns as well as cities that are majority 
majority black and Hispanic populations. And those cities are having trouble vaccinating their residents faster. They have uh, different obstacles and barriers to overcome. Um, And we also know that these populations, black and Hispanic residents, their average age of the populations are younger. So it means that less people of color are eligible right now for the vaccines in Connecticut. And um, the state is trying to, to find solutions on how to better allocate its doses and resources to these underserved communities and achieve better equity in their vaccine rollout as opposed to just vaccinating as many people as possible very quickly. Got it. So, Patty, let's bring you into the conversation. Last summer, data showed that Maine had the largest racial disparity in terms of COVID-19 infections. And at that time, Black residents were contracting COVID at 20 times the rate of white people. Has the state kept this in mind during its rollout? Yeah, and the racial disparity has narrowed since then, but it's still not good. So racial and ethnic minorities make up about 5% of Maine's population, and they account for about 10% of all cases. And the state is tracking how many people in these groups are getting the vaccine, and they're posting that information publicly on a website every day. But the problem is a lot of people, when they get a dose, are not giving the information. So it's really hard to tell at this point how Maine is doing with equity because about 30 percent of people are just not providing that information. Um, I have spoken to a manager of a health clinic in a community that serves a large immigrant population, and she says that there's a lot of vaccine hesitancy and that traditional public health messaging isn't really effective for this group. So from what I'm hearing, I think the state is going to need to come up with some other strategies to make sure that there's equitable distribution of the vaccine. And what else is the state of Maine grappling with right now? Well, we're focused on vaccinating people who are 70 and older. And there's been a lot of confusion and frustration in this group because there's kind of a patchwork system for signing up that's different depending on where you live. And so some of the first sites that offered vaccinations required people to sign up online. And that's a problem in a rural state like Maine, where there are many people who don't have an Internet connection, let alone a computer. Now there are more places that are offering a phone uh, option. Some allow people to pre-register where you can, you know, leave a message and then get a call back when there's an appointment available. But then other places you can't do that. So there's just a lot of variation, a lot of different things to keep track of. And there are people in this older age group that are worried they're going to fall through the cracks. And the state is aware of this and they're trying to create a centralized registration system, but it's not up and running yet. Okay, so it sounds like they're working on a solution. Martha, does this resonate with you, This these challenges of a decentralized system in mass and beyond? Yes, we're hearing from lots of people who don't know exactly how they're supposed to sign up. And there are different paths. You can sign up through your hospital. You can go to a public site in Massachusetts. You can also, in some cases, go to your local board of health if you're a resident and get a vaccine, say, at the senior center there. But this decentralizer, as as Patty was saying, this patchwork approach really causes a lot of confusion because it means people might sign up for appointments at more than one place, and then they go wherever they can get in first, but they might forget to cancel. And that messes up the supply of the place where they didn't show up, or it leaves an open appointment. That might lead to waste, or at least a scramble at the end of the day to try to be sure that you're not um, leaving vaccine in the vials. So it's really a problem that we don't have a centralized healthcare system, much less a centralized vaccination sign-up and delivery system. Now, all New England states are currently vaccinating older residents. They've moved into their second phase or phase 1B, depending on the state that you're in. Nicole, when Connecticut moves beyond that and enters the next grouping, people with serious health conditions and essential workers like teachers and grocery workers, is there any indication how they're going to decide who goes first among that, those groupings? Yeah, they're still figuring it out. They're taking it uh, one week at a time. But you're going to have to stratify within these groups because these groups account for such a large portion, at least of Connecticut's population, that it's otherwise going to be a little bit of a free-for-all if you open it to everybody all at once. Um, There have been earlier indications. The governor, as well as some other state officials, have indicated that teachers will be at the front of the pack uh, among uh, essential workers, but they haven't really fully committed to it. And a reason for that is if you make some of these decisions too early without knowing quite 
quite what the vaccination supply is going to be in a couple weeks or in a couple months, then you do risk uh, angering some people. And this is a very anxious time for a lot of people. So it'll be very difficult to determine who exactly goes next in those groups, but it has to be done. Okay, we'll leave it there. Connecticut Public Radio's Nicole Leonard, Maine Public Radio's Patty White, and WBUR's Martha Biebinger. Thank you all so much for your time. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Healthcare workers were the first people to be offered the vaccine, but a significant percentage of them opted against getting it. In Boston, GBH Radio's Gabriela Emanuel reports on why this is and what's being done about it. When Julie Mosca got an email about the COVID vaccine being available, she signed up for an appointment. She's a registered nurse at Cambridge Health Alliance and provides home care for older patients who would otherwise be in a nursing home, including those with COVID. But when Mosca got a follow-up email with the exact time of her vaccine appointment, she was hesitant. When I got the email, you're all set to receive it this day. And I was like, well, I'm not that ready to get it, like, this right away. Mosca says her brain buzzed with reasons not to get the vaccine. First, we don't know the long-term side effects of it. Second, I don't want to be the very first one to get it. Third, she says even after months of taking care of COVID patients, she still hadn't gotten it. Like, I don't think I need it. Mosca decided to cancel her appointment. It was just so many, so many questions going around. It was just really discouraging. Jed Geierhan runs the home elder care program where Mosca works. He says they saw around a third of their staff decline the vaccine. That's about the same as other medical settings in Massachusetts have reported, including long-term care facilities and hospitals. Most discouraging was that the group that was declining the vaccination highly aligned with people of color. And so that really gave us pause. Geierhan says he knew he needed to do something about this because communities of color have been disproportionately affected by COVID. So he reached out to Multicultural Affairs at the Cambridge Health Alliance. Avlo Kesa oversees that office. There is a level of fear and there is a level of mistrust uh, by people of color of our medical establishment. And, and, and they, are, they have valid reasons for that. Kesa, who is Haitian, says within his community, the vaccine has conjured up memories of U.S. health programs that went awry decades ago. Others have referenced the lasting trauma of the Tuskegee experiment and systematic racism. Kesa says at Cambridge Health Alliance, they have been reaching out to communities of color by offering town halls where people can ask questions, by publicizing and celebrating when people do get the vaccine, and by encouraging one-on-one peer conversations. And the number of staff members who have declined the vaccine in the elder care program has reduced. It went from about a third to about a quarter, and he's hopeful the numbers will keep dropping. Kesa says having healthcare workers understand the safety and importance of the vaccine is especially critical as their patients are deciding whether or not to be vaccinated. There can be a really uh, important force in, in helping patients to make that decision. As the post-holiday surge in COVID cases took hold, Mosca started regretting her decision not to get the vaccine. She says she was seeing a lot of COVID patients every day. There was a moment where she was trying to draw blood from a patient and she couldn't. I was afraid and literally like my, my hand was shaking. Looking down at her shaking hands, she decided to reverse course and get the vaccine, which she did in late December. Not long after, her husband and two-year-old son came down with COVID. Her husband isolated, but Mosca just couldn't separate from her son. Despite being with her ill child, she kept getting back negative COVID test results for herself. It was a miracle for me, but it's not really a miracle because it's, it's a new vaccine. The miracle was science. She says the vaccine likely protected her from getting COVID. For the New England News Collaborative, I'm Gabriella Emanuel. Nearly one year into the pandemic, and calculating risk has not gotten much easier. We ask ourselves, should I get the vaccine? Should I be worried about the new COVID variants? What can I do when I am vaccinated? We're going to talk about this with our next guest, Paul Turner. He's an evolutionary biologist, virologist, and professor at Yale University. Paul, welcome to Next. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. 
It's so great to have you. And I, I think a lot of our listeners have questions about COVID vaccination. So I'm really looking forward to tackling a number of them with you. But let's start here. For people who are holding off on getting vaccinated, you know, maybe they want to wait and see how other people react. What do you say? I say if you are in line to get the vaccine, you should have the vaccine. So uh, we have a very long history of vaccine technology of different forms. But uh, by and large, these have gone through clinical trials that show them to be safe. And if somebody's administered a vaccine, if there are any complications, they fall within a pretty understood range and the reasons why. So I think it's very safe to get the vaccine and to take the opportunity when given. What about long term? Because we don't really know for certain that the two approved COVID-19 vaccines in the U.S. do not come with long term health effects yet, right? That is technically true. And essentially any vaccine that we roll out, those data show up eventually but they wouldn't be immediately available just out of the necessity of you're using a technology or you're using a medicine and any way downstream effects of it have not happened yet. So that, I think, is a cause to be prudent in terms of how you use new technologies to create vaccines. And the long story short is that we're not doing many of these platforms differently than we did in the past. I guess there's also the argument to be made that you know, we don't know yet the long-term health effects of COVID. That is an incredibly important thing to remember because you see in the news already individuals who seem to have this very long-term effect, um, don't know when it's going to end, if ever, then that is not trivial. So that is caused by the virus. And if one wants to consider what's the risk of that versus a vaccine that seems to be very safe, and if there's any mild or even strong effects of it that they should wane over time after you recover from vaccination, that's nothing like what we're seeing with these very long-term effects of uh, the individuals who've been infected with sars cov too and can't quite recover. The Pfizer and Moderna vaccines, which are the two approved vaccines in the U.S., they're 95 and 94 percent effective. Should we feel good about that? Oh, yes. That's amazing efficacy. And what that means is if you look in the standard clinical trial approach of those who got the vaccine versus those who did not, then uh, there's this 95% improvement over your, uh, your inability to, uh, your ability, I'm sorry, to escape the harmful effects of infection, especially the very dangerous infections that can lead to mortality. So it's comparing across groups who have received a placebo versus the real vaccine and showing this kind of level of efficacy is about as good as you can possibly get. It could be 100%, but that would be very difficult to achieve. Everything you're saying, like, it, it feels good, right? It's like, it feels like, okay, this, these two vaccines, they sound like great news. Is there anything that's cause for concern right now? Well, certainly uh, everything that I'm reading in the news on average, gives me optimism. But the stuff that is concerning is also a real concern. If you have genetic variants of the virus that don't obey these efficacy estimates because they're different enough, they've mutated to change and be different than the kind of virus genotype that these vaccines were built on, then that is a cause for worry. It means more people will get sick, more of them may get a dangerous form of the illness, and it just prolongs the pandemic pushback, that if it uh, were just us against the standard form of virus, we know the rules that we're playing against. And as these new variants come about, there's so much intense research to figure out, are they worse in terms of this efficacy possibility? This is concerning, and it should be, but I still have a lot of optimism because we could talk about how the new vaccine platforms, for example, could work against these variants if they're retooled a bit. Yeah, well, let's stick with these variants because on February 7th, South Africa stopped using the AstraZeneca COVID-19 vaccine. It's a vaccine that's not approved here in the U.S., but is widely used in Britain. 
And they made that decision because evidence showed it did not stop people from getting infected by the new variant there in South Africa. What do we know about the two vaccines approved in the U.S., Pfizer and Moderna? Do we know how they're performing against new variants like this one or the one in Great Britain? Yeah, I think that's a great question. So the data are still coming in. And even the study that you mentioned, technically what it's showing is that if you compare the, again, the placebo group to those receiving the vaccine, with these new variants, there's less efficacy in preventing those variants if you get sick. There's less efficacy in preventing you from getting uh, a severe form of illness. So that is very troubling. But also in that is that there is some efficacy. We are not seeing any variants so far that are completely escaping vaccines altogether. That is a possibility. We are not seeing that yet. And that also gives me some optimism. Okay, so let's say someone has gotten two doses of the vaccine. Is it safe for them to hang out with other people who have been vaccinated, let's say, indoors Uh, without masks? Wow, that is a magical question right there. Let's see, I'll have to take that very You're the magical carefully. answer. <laughs> well, you know, usually it's a two-step question, where if you ask, okay, if I've been vaccinated and I'm protected, are those around me protected as well? And the answer is not necessarily. So what we don't know is something you kind of alluding to what you said earlier. We don't know the long-term effects of if you have a vaccine and you are protected, you know, how strong, first of all, is your protection over long haul, you know, six months or a year down the road? We don't know that because we don't have any individuals who could could have that measured. But the the point of if you get vaccinated and the virus enters you, uh, allowing a possibility of growth in your body and shedding you know, out into nature through uh, something that, you know, just normally happens if you sneeze, et cetera, if you're just breathing. So you can be protected and still shed the virus. Now, I'm expecting that to happen in a very small window of time compared to somebody who's not vaccinated. If they're not protected at all, whether they're symptomatic or asymptomatic, there's probably a much higher probability that they'd be shedding these viruses over a longer period of time, especially if they don't even know they're sick. So the The long-winded answer to your question is that uh, it is good to think about the vaccine protecting you, but you should still wear a mask to protect others around you. I think it's a wonderful question to be thinking about. If I was living in a bubble where everybody was vaccinated, then I would feel comfortable not wearing a mask under some situations if I knew for sure that the individuals had received their second shot and there was time enough for them to have the typical response. But I I just got to tell you, I'm a little uncomfortable with that advice until we get more data. It seems logical to me that that could be okay under some circumstances, but uh, I would hate for people to just sort of take that as a base fact and move forward with it. Well, yeah, because if if not then, then when? Because the vaccine has kind of been like this, in some ways, it can feel like this golden ticket, you know, out of this. But if if we're saying now that two people who are vaccinated can't spend time together in the way that we used to before the coronavirus, yeah, then when when is the end? Right, right. That's entirely right. And that's why my gut reaction is to say, yes, that should be completely fine, because that is the end goal anyway, right? And I, I suppose I'm just trying to be as cautious as possible, especially when giving people advice. But but you are certainly correct. That is the goal. You vaccinate people and you push back on the pandemic so much that we're not even really, we're breaking the chains of transmission and the virus can't move from person to person if you vaccinate enough people. I'm sure the listeners have heard a lot about herd immunity. If you vaccinate enough people, then this will happen. This is classic epidemiology. So when we get to that point, for sure, I think we're fine. If you consider it very carefully in a local setting, interacting with individuals who have been vaccinated, receive their second shot, if it's a two-shot dose, then I would say, yes, that should be fine for you to interact with one another. Now, there is the very slight chance that you could become sick because of the effectiveness of the efficacy of the virus is not, of the, I'm sorry, of the vaccines is not 100% for any of them. 
So this is all part of the risk calculation that people are doing in their heads. Well, I want to thank you so much. Paul Turner is an evolutionary biologist, virologist, and professor at Yale University. It's been so great talking to you, Paul. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Morgan. It was a pleasure. After the break, the asthma capital of the U.S. may soon be getting a wood-burning biomass plant. Residents are upset. And environmentalists say ropeless fishing gear could help save the endangered right whale. But that could still be years away. It's next. Next is made possible in part by our founding supporters who believe in the power of collaborative news coverage including the Common Sense Fund, supporting the New England News Collaborative in its coverage of climate change and the evolving clean energy economy. Support also comes from Douglas Stone and Mary Schwab Stone through the Smart Family Foundation of New York. Welcome back. I'm Morgan Springer. Springfield, Massachusetts is considered the asthma capital of the country, according to the Asthma and Allergy Foundation of America. Now, that same city could soon be home to the state's only large-scale wood-burning biomass plant. It's a scenario that seems much more likely if a new state proposal goes through. WBUR's Miriam Wasser has been reporting on biomass in Massachusetts and joins us now. Hey, Miriam. Hey, Morgan. Thanks for having me. Thanks for being here. So before we get to the rule change, tell us a little about this plant in Springfield. Where is it located and what would the construction of a biomass plant mean for that community? Sure. So the proposed plant will be located in a state-designated environmental justice community in the eastern part of Springfield. It's sort of a mixed industrial and residential area. To the west, there's a big highway and some electrical infrastructure. But to the east, there's a large working class neighborhood. And why there? Why are they thinking of putting it in that spot? So I think the simplest explanation for why the company behind the project wants to build there is that one of its subsidiaries actually owns the the area already. Um, But, you know, as I mentioned before, it's also right by the highway, which is crucial for the dozens of trucks that are going to have to come in and out every day to deliver 1,200 tons of wood. That's a lot of material, 1,200 tons of wood. Yeah, no, it really is. That's like a lot of trucks coming in and out there. Um, So... As for what this will mean for the community, according to health experts and those who live there, not good things. Uh, You know, this plant is going to be state of the art and will definitely be cleaner than a lot of older biomass plants in northern New England. But anytime you burn something like wood, it releases smoke and soot and other things that are bad to breathe in. And as you mentioned a minute ago, Springfield residents have some of the highest asthma rates in the country. Yeah. What are people in Springfield telling you? Yeah, so I um, during my reporting in this, I spoke often to Tanisha Arena, who heads up an environmental justice group called Arise in Springfield. And, you know, she says a lot of people are opposed to this. And she talks about how almost everyone that comes into her office has an inhaler. And, you know, she's met babies, like couple month old babies who have asthma and, and no one in Springfield wants this plant, she says. I live here. My kids live here. My friends live here. Like, I've got to breathe this. Why in this community can't we say no thank you and have that be the end of it? And Morgan, just to give you a little bit more context here, this plant was first proposed around 2008. So residents like Arena have been trying to stop this for over a decade. Okay, but biomass, it's considered a renewable energy. So is there an upside to building a biomass plant in Massachusetts? Yeah, that's a great question. So proponents of biomass say that it's carbon neutral, but in a lot of ways, that's kind of an oversimplification. You know, given the immediacy of our climate crisis, a lot of the people that I've talked to say it's it's kind of misleading to call something like replanting trees, which can take decades, if not a century to recoup that carbon that gets burned in the plant, um, that it's kind of misleading to call that carbon neutral. And back in 2008, 2009, Massachusetts was also debating the value of burning biomass. And then Governor Deval Patrick commissioned a big study that looked at forest-derived biomass. So this is like cutting trees from forest to burn for power. 
And his administration used those findings to create some of the strictest rules for biomass in the country. And those rules said that if a biomass plant wants to get renewable energy credits, which are worth a lot of money, they have to meet really high efficiency standards. And I don't want to bore you too much here in the weeds about what efficiency standards mean, but it's something that the plant in Springfield wouldn't meet. Wow. And so these are the rules that the state is thinking about rolling back. Exactly. In 2019, Governor Charlie Baker's administration proposed changing the state policies so that a biomass plant that uses so-called waste wood, so this is things like utility trimmings and some construction materials, but just not trees from forests, um, that those biomass plants would be exempt from efficiency rules. Here's what Chris Egan of the Mass Forest Alliance told me when I asked him about the rule changes. The simple fact is that the focus of this of these regulatory changes is to make more productive use of non forest derived wood. There's just a massive amount of that material. So what DOER is proposing is to be able to use that material to displace fossil fuels. Now, you know, critics are skeptical, one, that there is a massive waste wood problem, and two, that if that problem does exist, that building a biomass plant is a good solution. And I also want to note that it's unclear that the plant would make a big dent in displacing fossil fuels because it's only going to generate about 42 megawatts of power. And is that not very much? Uh, Not a ton. Not a ton. A lot of um, bigger gas plants generate far, far much more than that. So it sounds like this debate gets at a broader issue of what's renewable. You've told me in the past that a good amount of renewable energy in New England comes from burning trash and wood. But I don't know. To me, that doesn't sound like renewable energy. Yeah. I mean, I think I think what you're getting at is a sort of bigger question about whether everything that's quote unquote renewable is also quote unquote clean and desirable. But yeah, no, you know, here in New England on most days, burning wooden trash accounts for more than half of our renewable energy. Um, I actually have an app on my phone that breaks this down in real time, and I will open it up right now. And it appears that trash incineration is 40% of our renewable fuel mix, and wood incineration is 41%. Um, so that's that's about normal. Yesterday, wood was 40% and, and trash was 36 Now, I, I think that burning wood and burning trash are slightly different issues, but there is legitimate debate about how fair it is to call either of them renewable. And at least here in Massachusetts, this is something that some of the legislature have tried to take up in the past, and I think we'll be likely to do so again this session. In terms of this biomass plant in Springfield, what's next? Yeah, so the the plant is fully permitted, although the Springfield City Council, which um, really opposes this plant, they are actively looking for ways to stop it. So it's it's got all its permits. And experts that I've been talking to say that the future of the plant really hinges on these proposed rule changes that we talked about before, um, because without them, the plant might not be financially viable. It's unclear exactly what the timeline is for these proposed changes, but we're likely to see them finalized in the next couple of months. At which point should that happen, I think we can also expect to see environmental groups like the Conservation Law Foundation challenge these rule changes in court. Miriam Wasser is a reporter for WBUR's Earthwild team. Miriam, thank you so much for doing this. It's been great having you on the show. My pleasure, anytime. From Springfield, we now head to the ocean. The hope of saving North Atlantic right whales from extinction relies in large part on the idea that lobstermen will soon be able to push a button on their phones and recover lobster traps from the ocean floor. That would reduce, maybe even eliminate, whale entanglements and fishing gear, a leading cause of death. Last week, we heard how ropeless fishing works. And today, CAI's Eve Zukoff explores why it could still be a long way off. This isn't a winged insect or an electronic glitch. What you're hearing could be the sound of lobster fishing in the 21st century. It's an acoustic signal that a lobsterman can send from a phone app to a trap on the ocean floor, launching an inflatable buoy to the surface. Right now, the signal is coming from a lobster trap sitting on a table at a manufacturing facility in Wareham. So that's the release confirmation. Rob Morris sells this acoustic release system for the engineering company EdgeTech, which specializes in underwater technology. Looking at this table, 
Morris sees the future of the fishery, and many conservationists share that hope. But experts say ropeless is moving too slow. By the time working gear can get into the boats of thousands of lobstermen across New England, it may be too late to save critically endangered right whales. So what's the holdup? Well, money, for one. If you talk to fishermen about ropeless fishing, one of, if not the first question out of their mouths is, what is this going to cost? This is Mark Baumgartner a marine ecologist with the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution and vice chair of the Ropeless Consortium. To me, it's a 100% legitimate question. If this gear is going to be prohibitively expensive to them, adopting ropeless is essentially closing a fishery. Current edge tech systems could cost anywhere from $7,500 for one line of traps to $70,000 for a boat's total gear conversion. Economies of scale could bring that down, but even so, it's out of reach for nearly all fishermen. Government funding will be essential, says Erica Fuller, a senior attorney with the Conservation Law Foundation. Our hope is that in the Biden administration, you know, the urgency of right whales will translate to urgency in getting some of this funding available. Then there are technical issues to resolve, particularly around something called gear marking. Again, Mark Baumgartner. The gear location marking part of this is keeping us from moving forward to some kind of commercial adoption of this. Right now, each of the handful of ropeless gear manufacturers uses its own app to mark the location of traps. And their apps don't talk to one another. If there isn't a shared system for viewing gear, lobstermen could unknowingly entangle their traps in other fishermen's gear. It's a big sticking point for critics. Ropeless technology will not be safe or reliable until gear marking is figured out. The technology is just like we're at the Model T today and people expect us to be at the Tesla tomorrow. This is Beth Cassoni, executive director of the Massachusetts Lobstermen's Association. The association doesn't support ropeless technology. Cassoni says a shared database that will allow fishermen to see traps on the seafloor needs to be created. And we're still a long way away from finding out whether ropeless technology is viable for mass adoption. We need a large scale, scientific, unbiased feasibility study on the whole thing. We need to put five boats in a big square, fish and ropeless, mobile gear, and see what really happens. In Massachusetts, efforts are underway. The state recently announced a 12 month ropeless feasibility study. But Cassoni brings up a bigger point, really the hidden hurdle. If lobstermen's perception is that ropeless technology is dangerous, unreliable, or economically impractical, they won't be willing to use it during closures, let alone during the rest of the year. Conservationists like Mark Baumgartner are keenly aware of what could happen if these hurdles aren't overcome. And soon. The dual problems of the extinction of the right whale and incredibly difficult times, if not the extinction of the trap fishing industry, could be addressed simultaneously with a single solution if we can get ropeless right. Experts say we're still at least five years away from knowing whether ropeless is the answer. And in those five years, the thing that will make a difference is how bad we want it. For the New England News Collaborative, I'm Eve Zukoff. Coming after the break, patrolling the ski slopes during a pandemic. It's next. Next is made possible in part by our founding supporters who believe in the power of collaborative news coverage, including the John Merck Fund, supporting the New England News Collaborative in its coverage of climate and clean energy. Okay, we're back. As Vermonters get in line for the COVID-19 vaccine, the governor's decision to prioritize ski patrollers ahead of teachers and grocery clerks angered some people. But the men and women who provide slopeside care for injured skiers and snowboarders are highly trained first responders. Most are licensed emergency medical technicians with additional outdoor emergency care training. Most are also volunteers, and Vermont's $1.6 billion ski industry could not operate without them. 
With thousands of people flocking to the slopes from states with higher rates of infection for COVID-19, Vermont's 1,300 registered ski patrollers, like everyone else, have had to figure out how to do their job safely. Vermont Public Radio's Nina Keck reports. Good morning, Jen. How are you? Good. It's not quite 8 a.m., and just below the gondola at Stratton Mountain, about 20 ski patrollers, all wearing bright red, are getting ready to start their shift. All right, everybody! Normally, this group would gather indoors in the warmth of the first aid room. But because of the pandemic, patrol director Chris Schilling briefs them outside. What, am I missing something? Why are there so many of you here today? I'm, I'm grateful. I'm grateful to see you all here. This is awesome. According to National Ski Patrol data, the average age of patrollers is over 50, and most are volunteers. At Stratton, a third of their volunteer patrollers chose not to work this year because of health concerns. So today's turnout is welcome. Nationwide, ski patrollers who do get paid are among the lowest paid workers in the country. Most earn close to minimum wage with no benefits. Because of the pandemic, resorts across Vermont have seen patrols shrink this year. And many have had to hire new recruits to compensate. Uh, Okay, a couple things going on. Let's see here. Going to shoot right down this real quick. During this recent Uh, Friday meeting, patrollers hear what trails have been groomed, what, if any, problems snowmakers have reported, and what to expect weather-wise. Today's forecast is calling for 6 to 12 inches of new snow. That's good news. Yeah. So guys, just a reminder, PPE all the time, right? Anytime you're with a guest, anytime you have an interaction, base area, summit, on the hill, make sure you have the PPE. We have lots located at the summit. Nearby the towns summit. like Manchester and Windhall are experiencing higher rates of infection right now. So are other ski towns like Killington and Dover. Ski resorts, in consultation with state health officials, are taking extensive measures to keep visitors, employees, host towns, and ski patrollers safe. But it's not always enough. Last month, Hunter Mountain, a ski area in New York, had to close for three days after members of its ski patrol got COVID-19. Patrollers at Stratton were buzzing about it. People weren't wearing their masks in the base the other day, Wednesday. And I said, we want to all stay open, don't we? I said, please put your mask on. And they said, why? What's the big deal? I said, do you know what happened to Hunter Mountain? They had to shut down. Josh, you want to do Janeway, West Me- East Meadow, Lower Wanderer? Josh Rosenblum has offered to let me ski along for the morning. He's been a paid patroller at Stratton for 19 years. He's also a physician assistant in nearby Townsend. We're going to go right through the wind fence past the gondola. I'll follow you. All righty. Overall skier traffic is down because of the state's public health guidelines, and Rosenblum says there seem to be fewer injuries because of that. We don't see any on the runs we take. I keep up, but my skiing is awkward with a microphone in one hand and my digital recorder in the other. My gear starts to act sluggish in the cold. You need me to hold anything? No, I'm trying to figure this out. I'm trying to keep my recorder warm. Yeah, yeah. So you can see just with your equipment in the cold what it's like for us in the cold, just trying to do some of the PPE. You know, the masks get wet, they're not as effective. There's no way to wear a face shield as you're skiing. I mean, luckily we have goggles. Rosenblum says he's had COVID already. He got it last March after a ski trip out west. He's also been vaccinated, something he's grateful for. So he's not personally worried about getting sick while patrolling. But he says there's still a lot we don't know about how the virus spreads. He's wearing a regular mask as we talk. If he'd have to stop for an injured skier, he says he'd switch to an N95 mask like those worn in hospitals. And it's difficult to because you got to take your helmet off to get them on. So you come across a wreck on the trail and you have to take a minute and kind of step back and suit up. And it's been um, a bit of a learning process for us. Two nine one. Good, how are you? All right. How can I help? A few hours later, outside Stratton's first aid clinic, a skier who injured his leg the day before is checking to make sure it's not broken. Uh, Let me ask you some questions, all right? Uh, Questions like where the skier is from, if he quarantined, and if he's feeling any COVID-like symptoms. All of this happens outside the clinic's sliding glass doors. Well, come on in. Unfortunately, you can't come with him. All right. Okay? So I'll just the car. go back to the car again. Yeah. The skier's friend has to stay outside. She heads to her car to warm up. 
Kevin Glassman, a longtime volunteer patroller, stands nearby. Glassman is an anesthesiologist in New York. He's got a ski home in Manchester. He can patrol in Vermont as an essential worker. But since he doesn't live in the state full time, he's not allowed in the first aid clinic either. He also can't use the ski patrol locker room this year, which he admits makes patrolling a lot less comfortable. But he loves to ski and says to ensure resorts stay open, following pandemic protocols is critical. Your background, the other job that you have, you've intubated, you've seen, you've seen the ravages of COVID. Up close and uh, unfortunately far too many. Does that make you more leery patrolling this year? It doesn't make me more leery. It just makes me way more defensive about my own safety and the safety of everybody else that's here. Glassman hasn't had COVID yet, which amazes him. And he's grateful that he's gotten his second dose of the vaccine. Most skiers at the resort are wearing masks and practicing social distancing, he tells me. But he admits he has a very low threshold for anyone who's not. That was Vermont Public Radio's Nina Keck. Songs tend to reflect the times in which they're written. With the passage of time, they often come to mean new things. In honor of Valentine's Day, independent producer Judith Kogan considers two 1950s doo-wop songs with an oddly contemporary motif. It sounds like Zoom, but it's spelled Z-O-O-M, just like the online platform. In 1958, the Harlem-based doo-wop group called the Collegians made it the musical foundation for a love song they called Zoom, Zoom, Zoom. the bane of your pandemic existence when from dawn to dusk and beyond you're glued to the platform until, square-eyed, you expire from Zoom fatigue. But for the collegians, it seemed an ideal lyrical bed for a marriage proposal. In terms of phonetics, how could you miss? Lawrence Patilli, author of the book Doo-Wop Acapella, says that Zoom is an ideal nonsense syllable to show off the singer's skill and hook the listener. The letter sounds, he says, work well together. You have these very, very organic sounds that are coming out. You have a vibratory Z, you have an open vowel, and it concludes with a bilabial two-lip sound. It's going to work. But inspiration may have come from another doo song, called simply Zoom. In that song, recorded by the Cadillacs, the onomatopoetic Zoom, depicting speed and movement, gets the melody going. During the pandemic, Zoom of a different sort has been the conduit to corporate meetings and funerals. But also, the sweet things in life. The introduction to newborns, reunions with long-lost friends, and weddings. People have dated on Zoom. Some, like Kayla MacArthur and Ryan Crane, who connected virtually through a mutual friend, have fallen in love. It allowed two people who might have never met in person to come together. For me, it is just incredibly (laughs) serendipitous and surreal. For many couples, the place where they first met has special emotional resonance. The nightclub, the college quad, the bus stop. For those whose eyes first locked on Zoom, the visceral memory may not be quite as rich in sensory stimuli. But still... Just all like, whoa, how did this all happen? (laughs) It happened because in the pandemic, Zoom was a life, or rather, a love line. For the New England News Collaborative, I'm Judith Kogan. I love you, baby. 
And that's a wrap on Next this week. You can find our show wherever you get your podcasts. Just search Next New England. Next is produced by me, Morgan Springer, and Lily Tyson. Vanessa De La Torre is our executive editor. The executive producer is Katie Talarski. The New England News Collaborative is powered by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, Connecticut Public Radio, Vermont Public Radio, New Hampshire Public Radio, Maine Public Radio, New England Public Media, CAI, WBUR, WSHU, GBH, and the Public's Radio.